let's start with the last talk before lunch uh, about expressive linear algebra in Haskell from Henning Thielmann. Yeah, have fun and enjoy. Hi. Uh, I want to give a talk about my new approach to how I like to do linear algebra with Haskell. Um, I have worked with H matrix for many years and solved real world problems with it. And over time, I found uh, I could do better than just uh, juggling with integer integers as indices. And um, I want to examine an example with you in order to show what I mean. And uh, despite we are being in the practice track, I've chosen an academic <laughs> example. So uh, this is an assignment. I got in my computer science studies. We uh, were given a uh, network of resistors and we had to uh, determine the overall resistance of the network. And this uh, network is shaped uh, like a cube. Um, um, and it's not so simple that you can do a parallel, a par parallel um, configurations and serial configurations of uh, resistors, but it's uh, a complicated example, yes. And what I did to solve the problem, uh, I applied uh, some conversion rules for uh, converting star topologies into three triangle topologies and back. And I did this uh, there and there and there. In the end, I got a number, and it was wrong. <laughs> So, and the official solution was different to mine, and I wanted to know, ah, the offic official explanation was, ah, look, here are uh, symmetries, and then you can simplify it this way and this way, and then it's easy, and I didn't buy that. <laughs> and I wanted to know exactly, and I, I tried to solve it with the uh, linear algebra. So, this is the example I want to show you. So what do we have to do if we want to compute the total resistance of this network? Um, we have to apply three laws. Um, first law is Ohm's law. This is uh, resistance is the um, ratio of uh, voltage and the current that flows through the resistor. Second law is the Kirchhoff's node law or current law. It means every current that flows into a node must go out again, such that the uh, sum of the signed currents at each node is zero. This is, I have written some examples there. And the third law is um, voltages are essentially uh, differences of potentials. So every uh, node has a potential, and the voltage is always difference between two potentials. These are the laws. And then I can build a big matrix. Um, so for instance, um, this equation means uh, current multiplied by resistance is uh, voltage. And voltage is in turn a difference of two potentials. This is the equation, and you can find it somewhere here. I guess this one, uh, this R multiplied by I, and then we have this difference of potentials. Okay? And in this part of the matrix, you have one row for every edge and one column for every node. And you see every edge has two nodes, which it connects, and it's always uh, plus one and minus one. OK? And uh, surprisingly, you find the same matrix here, but in a flipped net transposed way. So why is that the case? Because um, it's just two different views on the same graph. In this graph, you um, consider the edges and what nodes connect the edges. And this is, uh, you uh, watch every node 
and look what patches are connected to this node. So overall, you find that this matrix is symmetric. Ah. And if you use uh, edge matrix or you use octave or middle, uh, you will usually not make, um, you cannot benefit from the symmetry in terms of space saving or optimized computing. Well, moreover, the I and B are completely generic. They are ir irrelevant to the solution, right? So mm -hmm. you may right. Get, get it's only a question of performance. Pick some values and then you have a concrete problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, the slides just summarize up what I have said. Um, so, we observe this metric, this symmetric. It's also composed from blocks. <coughs> And even more, e every block has a special substructure. And I asked myself, can I represent this with a Swiss type system? OK, yes, I can. So I defined some fancy in uh, infix operators, not only one. But for this problem, I need one to divide a column vector by a matrix, so to speak. And in this case, the matrix is symmetric. And it has a certain number of elements. It's the height, it's also the, the width. And then uh, I need this vector, and the result is again a vector. Uh, in this case, the vector contains voltages, currents. And uh, in the end, I have to divide the right voltage to the right current. Okay, and this is just the interface then for the for a LAPAC for time. In this case, it's symmetric packed matrix and use the solution by uh, decomposition in triangular matrices. Okay, and now the difference to each matrix or say octal is that we have not only an integer number that specifies the height of the matrix, but it is the structure. I have called this shape. Okay, and I need this equality constraint in order to check this, that the height structure of the matrix um, fits to the structure of the vector. Okay, I defined uh, a new shape type class. Um, for most of what I do, it's enough to determine the size of the shape. Because in the end, I hand it over to LAPAC, and LAPAC computes only with integer indices, and I uh, don't need any indices at all. <coughs> but um, especially for the construction of my matrix and my vector I need indices. And then I have defined another class for index shapes, and it has a type function. And it assigns every shape type an index type. So with this definition, my uh, access operator to the arrays uh, looks like this. I have an array with a certain shape, and I have an index that fits to the shape and I get the element. Okay. Most simple example is uh, zero-based counting and an according shape, and then the index is just the type that I want to use to specify the size of the array. So for instance, if I choose to count elements with int, then the index type is also int. Um, and this is already different to uh, plain Haskell arrays because if I choose an Haskell 98 array with lower bound zero, uh, 
at construction time I know that the lower bound is zero, but if I do something with it, people can pass me anything. It can stop with one or two or minus one. And then I need again uh, uh, dynamic checks. I want to uh, avoid that. Okay. Now we come to more interesting checks. What about an enumeration type that is bounded? So I define a shape type for enumerations. And if I have an enum type that is enumeration and bounded, then I can use this as index type. Okay? Index type for enumeration shapes is just the enum type. So for instance, if I choose an array with three elements, and the elements are indexed with lower than, equal, and greater than, then I can just use this shape in enumeration ordering, and I have this index type ordering. So, hmm? so your approach is uh, with, with matrix operations, you want uh, folds, I guess, in the end. So you, you um, translate all your uh, shapes to ranges of integers, I guess, and then you iterate all of those. In the end, everything is broken down to integers. Mm -hmm. what And I want this higher um, front end in order to describe my problems more naturally. So now I don't need to uh, do some index calculation anymore in my application. I can just, for, uh, for instance, compare two uh, values and use the list index into the array. Okay, I can proceed uh, in the usual way. I can do Cartesian products by using pairs of shapes. I can append arrays. Then I have an either index. Either I'm in the first part of the index uh, in the area or in the second part. Um, that is the way I describe the block matrices. And now for my example, I define some enumerations. For instance, I have uh, coordinates. These can always be left or right. In every dimension, I have three dimensions, x, y, and z. The corner is defined uh, by three coordinates. An edge is defined by a dimension. And then two coordinates. And then I define uh, this corner shape is a shape of a vector that has an element for every node. Uh -huh. Because I have three coordinates and then I have a shape for the vector that holds all the edges. I have this um, shape with three elements and then these with two elements each. And then I can compose them um, by concatenation. Just the additional line I need in my matrix and then the edges in the corners. Okay. Of course, in the end, everything is broken down to integers, but I don't have to write these uh, conversion functions in my application anymore. Uh, the library automatically checks that matrix and vectors have consistent structures. I am free from deciding whether I am using 0 or 1 based indexing and I, I can do less errors. Okay. Uh, I want to show you the real code that runs the example, but I'm afraid you can't read this in the. Can you read this in the last row? No. Okay. Uh, maybe I can just show that something happens here. Um, I have uh, used the Hyper Haskell notebook editor, and it gives me a, a way to interactively work with the expressions. And especially, it gives me nice formatting of the matrices. Okay. Uh, this is the matrix you already know. 
Uh, and you might see that I have uh, printed these uh, entries with italics because I want to say this is only the data that is actually stored and the rest is just flipped. Okay, I will switch back to the slides. Okay, what do I have to do to construct the matrix? Um, remember the ones with the ones and minus ones? I first construct an area that contains our indices for all edges. Then for every edge, I insert uh, two nodes, one with plus, one with minus. Um, I have to convert this uh, encoding of the edges into real coordinates with this helper function. And in the end, I just concatenate all those two metrics. Then I have another um, operator for uh, stacking of matrices while preserving symmetry. If I have a symmetric matrix, and another symmetric matrix, and I have an average value matrix B, then this whole matrix is also symmetric. This is expressed by this type. How do you make the shapes uh, add up? Mm. You can't put arbitrary A, B, and C there, can't you? Uh, these two shapes must match. Uh, I have uh, I have omitted the equality constraint, yes, I have to add this. Um, my idea was you can use these dynamic checks for shapes with dynamic uh, size, but if you use uh, static shapes, then the equality checks uh, don't do anything, like in this example. Okay, this means um, this height must match this one, same type you see. The width of this matrix must match the width of this matrix. And in the end you get a matrix with um, the size that consists of this height and this one. Okay, and then I can construct the full matrix in the right lower part, it's everything zero. Then we have the diagonal matrix with the resistances, and right, we have this uh, matrix with the nodes and edges. And then at the top, we have a single row with the unit vector, that means a single one. Um, and that's already the end. I define the, the source corner, it's the one with all zeros, and the destination corner is the one with all ones. Then I need another unit vector divided by this matrix, and then I have to uh, pick the right value from the solution vector and have to correct the sign. Okay, and the result of all of resistances are equal, then I have. Uh, 5 over 6 from one of the uh, partial resistors. Okay. What does it buy me? Uh, metric symmetry uh, allows me to use specialized solvers by LATAC. I need only help of the space, and I have even some algebraic properties. So if the matrix is not only uh, symmetric but Hermitian, then eigenvalues are all uh, I can express this with types. Um, you can watch the complete example in the package resistor queue if you want to. Um, 
Yes, uh, some problems. It's uh, still pretty lovely visual example. Um, but even if you have real persistent networks, it can help you. Just one more shape type. Uh, this time, uh, how about using an arbitrary set uh, of elements as a shape? which means uh, every element of the set can be an index. Um, it's isomorphic to a map, like in containers. It's, it has still a word make block up, no insert, no delete. But instead, uh, we can do all the matrix co uh, computations. So why not? And then um, the full matrix definition changes to this um, signature. So we get a graph with the edge and node type and some uh, starting node. And the shape of the symmetric matrix is then generalized to an arbitrary set of edges and an arbitrary set of nodes. But the implementation is almost the same. Okay, this is the good news. The bad news is uh, matrix A is pretty sparse, and even more, uh, most big matrix problems are sparse. <laughs> and Clapac, which I use, has no specialized algorithms for this, so I don't provide them to. Um, also, the uh, LAPAC library ignores any block structure. It's only for my, um, it's only for, for, for me for simplified programming in Haskell, but LAPAC doesn't know about it. Um, okay, this would be future work. We could certainly uh, represent the block structure differently in Haskell and then make use of it because. Um, you have seen the matrices have even more simple structures. One matrix is completely zero. And uh, the other matrix is just a diagonal matrix. So we could uh, do this uh, optimization, certainly, uh, with LAPAC. OK, um, what other features has my new binding? Um, I can use matrices as vectors. Sometimes this can be useful. Um, I have generated uh, bindings to low-level bindings to LAPAC and PLAS. Um, I've written a kind of Fortran signature parser in order to generate them, generate them all. Uh, also, for the testing framework and. I can also process the matrices and vectors with LLVM if I like to. And I have added support for this uh, strongly hyped interactive notebook at all. Mm. One more interesting thing. Um, LAPA consists of hundreds of uh, functions and I wanted to support them all with all available types. And uh, it's lucky that LAPA supports only four types. A uh, floating point with single and double precision and the complex uh, versions of them. Um, so what did I do? I have defined a closed world class. Uh, this means I cannot add more types, but I can add methods uh, without extending the class. And it's still plain Haskell 98. Uh, and it works by defining a kind of type case. I have called this uh, switch wheel. Um, you have to pass it in Functor uh, with a float implementation of the function and an implementation with double. And it chooses from the two the one 
that you need. So for float, it chooses the first one, and for double, it chooses the second one. And how do you use that? You define a new type. This has this uh, type parameter, A. See it here. And this expands to this function. Or some uh, pointer into the array and some size parameters. And then I do this type case. And I either use the uh, single precision implementation or the double precision implementation. This way I can support all types for all functions of LAPAC. Same for um, complex numbers. Okay. Um, I have also put some thoughts in how do I manage transposition of triangular matrices um, and how do I cope with matrices that are higher than than white because I need this for uh, these square problems. Um, but maybe I can skip this for today and come to the end. So my LAPAC planning is uh, based on LAPAC and GLASS. Uh, advantages, it is available almost everywhere. And there are also many implementations that do various optimizations. Optimizations with respect to cache usage and with respect to usage of vector functions. And it provides many advanced functions like linear solvers and least square solvers and minimum norm solvers and eigenvalues and singular value decompositions for many common matrix types and I have supported most of them in my library. Um, this advantage is uh, we are restricted to these four base types. G we cannot add more precision types or finite fields or interval arithmetic would also be an interesting application. We have no sparse matrices, we have no batch processing. Uh, EG if, if we want to uh, compute many equally sized problems in parallel. This is not supported by LAPAC and surprisingly LAPAC even misses some simple functions like matrix transposition or minimum and maximum or product of numbers. Okay, already existing Alternatives in Haskell are H matrix. Um, it supports dynamic sizes of matrices, but also static sizes. But in the case of static sizes, the, these are just numbers, just integers. And you have the Riga and Accelerate um, area frameworks. Mm. And these are restricted to cubic shapes. And I think this is for efficiency reasons. Um, and you have, of course, Haskell 98 arrays. They are quite flexible, but you always have to choose the same type for the indices and the edit shape. Okay. Oh, your take home message. There's more to static checks on mat matrix computations than type level natural numbers. You can have more special matrix types, which better documents your codes and allows for optimizations. And this the transposition thing I have skipped this. Okay. Ah. Then I'm eager to your questions. to run it on Windows, and I had uh, a hard times with uh, the pink uh, LAPAC uh, libraries, and uh, even more, some libraries have uh, strong uh, licensing like GPL, 
uh, for so it's not suitable for in uh, in companies uh, development. And uh, I would like to ask: uh, Do you have plans to get rid of all the pack uh, uh, backend and write your own? Uh, you I can write your own. have commercial licenses. So it should be possible to link against those. Yes, but, but it's, it's not that easy to, to just run it and experiment with it on Linux. On Linux it's much easier. But if you just want to experiment it, then you can just run it on Linux, can you? Uh, not that, uh, if I don't have Linux machine, I cannot. Yes? You'll have to get one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the same for Linux people. If uh, you say them that uh, it's only supported on Windows. It, it's not good uh, argument. I mean, uh, it, it, it's good to work on, on all the operating systems, like maybe Mac, uh, Linux, and Windows. Uh, you're free to implement your own LAPAC <laughs> implementation on Windows or anywhere? Uh, okay. It would solve your problem, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> but it's too, too resource. Okay. Much resource intensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you? Hmm? What? Do you plan? No. Okay. <laughs> Certainly not. Uh, but I don't know the original reference implementation in Fortran. Does it have restricted licenses? I uh, don't. I don't think so. Um, it's very simple and basic, um, and it's not optimized. But it's uh, certainly faster than if you write something in Haskell from scratch. Try this one. Okay, sounds good. Uh, how good are the type error messages that you get in install line up? What do they look like? Yeah, uh, shall I provoke some? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, okay, you don't see the cyber thing from the last problem, right? Well, I can read it. Huh? See how, see how long yeah. we are yeah. How long? Okay. <laughs> well, we can come to the front. <laughs> Right. Okay. Uh, for instance, we uh, switch this on. Okay. Uh, ah, no instance for num on the unit type with the literal zero. Can you read this? Yeah. Uh, this was a short one. So you want a number one? Yes. True. So, uh, for instance, we could uh, do the wrong associativity. Okay, we add the parentheses here and one there. Is this better? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can always make Haskell read a long error message. That's not hard. <laughs> go, into your, go into your library. So, what it says. Ah, I have, I have made the wrong associativity when putting together the blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, so now it says the uh, size of the whole block doesn't match the one of the part. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but the rest of the type error just says where the error is in the expression. And then it lists the expression and the sub-expression in an equation for full matrix. Uh -huh. Okay. Other one looks a little bit more worrisome, right? Because hmm? the next one has a lot of weak into the error message somehow. Couldn't match type. Uh, ah, okay. Um, by uh, the wrong associativity, I have combined a pair of matrices where a matrix was expected. Mm -hmm. So it says here, couldn't match matrix with pair of matrices. So um, I don't know. I think metal abusers won't like that because long error messages. What uh, MATLAB will, it will execute any kind of thing that you type. Yes. <laughs> so that's the, that's their way to uh, <laughs> to avoid error messages. Yes. <laughs> but that, that's related to that. Um, I think the operations can still yield runtime errors, can they? Hmm? Um, you are for instance, if you add two vectors that have the, not the same size, you still make a runtime error out of it. 
Uh, this depends. This depends okay. of the kind of shape I ah. use. If you use static shapes, <coughs> it will give a compile time error. If you use uh, dynamic shapes, it will give a runtime error. So I choose this design in order to write all functions only once mm -hmm. and give the people who want uh, advanced type level features, use them. And if you are okay with runtime errors, you can use plain. It's not Haskell 98, but close to. I mean, I, I very much like that you can actually have static type shapes, but yes. um, I wonder if you couldn't also do away with the runtime errors and just say if, if it's an um, unlimited um, size, then uh, basically all, it will just append zero. But this is maybe a bit uh, unsurprising for some people, but if you know to expect it, then I think it's the more uh, sensible option. Maybe. I think I would not like this <laughs> automatic. Uh, automatic extensions. Exactly what this is this is MATLAB. What's what MATLAB does? And <coughs> I've uh, I've got uh, funny uh, mistakes that students made uh, with such automatic extension. They submitted solutions to me that run in cubic time for a botnet metric server that run should run in linear time. And what they made is they um, they added new elements to a matrix, and this way uh, MATLAB always had it to copy a small quadratic matrix into a larger one. And then they got a uh, 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 algorithm with a uh, cubic runtime, and they didn't uh, they didn't notice it because it was ready um, in a second, and they thought thousand elements one second that's a good time, but and it wasn't. Does this really apply? Because here you're doing purely functional. Uh, Yes, in a sense, MATLAB is also functional in this respect. They didn't do in place updates, they copied the old matrix into mm -hmm. a new one. I, I wouldn't like that, I have to say. Okay, uh, you? That's very nice. Um, you had this the indexing function takes an, uh, an array of a particular shape and then index elements for that shape. Mm -hmm. It gives you an element. So you can think of that as translating the array into a function from the right. elements. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that is it still always a uh, um, uh, bijection that so you can learn back from the no uh, it's not right no uh, for instance I can use zero based indexing or one based indexing but both uh, map to integer indexes yes but if you if you know the indexing uh, regime uh, you can take your array you can turn it into a, a function for indices and for, for the same indexing regime you can turn that back into So you could certainly do, uh, use uh, specialized integer types. Also, the integer with type tags that allows you to convert back to the shape type. Would this be an idea? I think for finite types, that would be okay. Yeah, like the like the ones we saw in the cube examples. Well, for the enumeration types, for instance. So the nice thing about the index representation is transposition is trivial because it's just swapping the two arguments in function. Uh -huh. So this is a representation that's used in the accelerator part of this example. It's nice to be able to convert back and forth to and from that uh, representation. We should talk. So, so the viewpoint of, of Baypack, of the back uh -huh. end, um, your types are basically um, the standard Baypack matrix types with some phantom type parameters, aren't they? When you say, well, this, this one is a symmetric one, or uh, it has this shape or so. Because Baypack is just mm -hmm. just arrays of any kind of integer mm -hmm. dimension, right? So, so you're, you're just adding these phantom type parameters to have some static checks that would otherwise uh, uh, generate runtime errors in late -end. They aren't even on the uh, phantom types because I really need some data on the Haskell side. Um, the shape, the triangular shape, for instance, encodes 
uh, it contains the size in form of another shape, and it contains whether it's lower triangular or upper triangular. Yeah. So these are type parameters, yeah. but if they are not even front end. Okay, but then uh, at some point I call the back structure and I throw all this extra information away and just hand over a plain pointer. Mm -hmm. No questions left, so thank you very much again for your talk.